I guess probably the first time I met Lord Beaverbrook was when I was in law school in 1946. And he was out here for a fall convocation at UMB. I was president of the Law School Society. We were located in St. John at that time. And uh, we invited him down to our annual dinner. And he came and uh, we had a most convivial evening, actually. One of the things he was most interested in was the fact that another chap and I had debated, had debated against uh, Dalhousie Law School at Halifax uh, a month before that or several weeks before that. And we had defeated Dalhousie Law School in the debate. And Beaverbrook took great delight in that fact. And uh, I, I think he really felt, and I think it was the beginning of his, his feeling that the law school should be put in a little better location than it was in at, the, at that time. It was in the provincial building in St. John. Mind you, there weren't too many students, perhaps 20 or 25, I guess, altogether. And of course, it was only very shortly after that he did acquire the Hazen building in St. John. The law school was moved there. This was after I graduated. And uh, very shortly after that, it came up to Fredericton where it really belonged. And that was all done with his help. Uh, later that year, of course, the, uh, the next year, the, I applied for a, the, It was announced that the Overseas Beaverbrook Scholarships would be established. And uh, I, I had applied for a Rhodes Scholarship that winter in my last year at, at uh, law school. And I think I narrowly missed out, as I was later told, on getting that. I mean, it did take the committee until about 2 o'clock in the morning to decide between Erskine Carter and myself. But, uh, he was successful and I wasn't, but then I applied for a Beaverbrook scholarship, and uh, which perhaps suited me better actually at the time because I was married and had a child on the way, and uh, the Beaverbrook uh, s scholarship arrangement provided for families as well as for the scholar himself or herself. And uh, in the fall of, in August of 19. Uh, 47, we went off in a group aboard a Canadian Pacific uh, merchant boat, the uh, Beaver Fort, I believe it was called, out of Montreal. We arrived in Liverpool, and uh, Beaverbrook had all his London Express photographers out to greet us at the at the uh, quayside in Liverpool. Uh, the uh, we we were all lined up at the rail on the ship, while they took pictures. Uh, we had our baby, uh, Andy, was, had been born three weeks, my son Andy had been born uh, uh, three weeks before that, and uh, he was carried in an Indian basket, which was about two feet long and uh, a foot and a half across. And we'd, we'd put a rubber air mattress in the bottom of that and blankets and so on. And uh, the photographers asked my wife Lorna to hold the, who was a British war bride, to hold the baby up so he could be included in the picture. And she held the basket up and they said, oh no, we don't want the basket. We just want to see the baby. So she put the basket down on the ground and picked Andy out of the basket. But in so doing, she picked up the rubber mattress as well and held it up. To our consternation, it disclosed the fact that she was smuggling three bottles of scotch ashore <laughs> in the bottom of the basket. They didn't, fortunately, take uh, pictures of that, and the proper pictures appeared on the front page of the Daily Express the next day. But we had a, uh, a most enjoyable year in England. Uh, there were so many highlights, it's difficult to name them all. Uh, uh, Lord Beaverbrook took a great interest in us, in it ourselves. Very shortly after we arrived, he put on a big reception at the, uh, with a couple of hundred industrialists and. Uh, business people present uh, at the Dorchester Hotel on Park Lane. And uh, he took great pleasure in introducing us all around as these colonials uh, who were over to study at London University, and several of us at the London School of Economics. And uh, we did all sorts of things that year. At his, uh, the chairman of his group of newspapers, the Express Group, was Tom Blackburn, who later became Sir Tom Blackburn. and. Uh, Blackburn, I think, had been instructed to take a personal interest in us. He certainly did, even to the point that uh, 
when my son Andy was christened a few months later, he became the godfather. And uh, later, uh, Sir Tom was brought out to Fredericton and given an honorary degree by UNB, of course, on the suggestion of Lord Beaverbrook. Another person was the Chancellor of London University, David Hughes Perry, who later became Sir David Hughes Perry and who later became the Chancellor of the University of Wales. Uh, he took a great interest in us and had, had us out to his home in the London suburbs. But we had access to just about anybody we wanted over there. Uh, uh, one of the, a couple of the other chaps, Carlisle Hansen and John McNair and I had an interview with Harold Lasky, uh, the famed socialist economist, or socialist politician, I guess you'd call him. Uh, uh, we had, he was teaching at the London School of Economics at the time, and we had a, an afternoon with him, actually. He took a great interest. It was amusing. Actually, later we met Beaverbrook at Arlington House, which is, was his London townhouse. He entertained us there that winter one evening. Uh, Brendan Bracken was pres present. He had been Minister of Information during the war in Churchill's cabinet. Uh, Beverly Baxter, who used to write for Maclean's magazine and was an expatriate Canadian who was a member of the British Parliament, was present. And I think Beaverbrook's nephew, uh, I forget his name now, who was also a member of Parliament, were there. That was the most enjoyable evening. There was a case of whiskey on the sideboard and Beaverbrook's instructions when we entered where it was to be finished before anyone was allowed out. And I think we did a pretty good job of it, actually. But it was an enjoyable evening. Uh, Beaverbrook was very partial toward Brendan Bracken. He thought Brendan Bracken should succeed Churchill as uh, leader of the Conservative Party in England and should become Prime Minister. He had very li little use for uh, Anthony Eden, uh, because he said Anthony Eden was a terribly dull, unintelligent fellow, I don't know. I, the only thing I can say about Eden is Beaverbrook had also later arranged a visit for my wife and myself to a royal garden party at Buckingham Palace, and I stood next to Anthony Eden. I tried to assess his intelligence, but I didn't have much chance to do that, but I can say that he had terribly rotten teeth. His teeth were terrible. I was always admire, an admirer, actually, of uh, Eden when he was Foreign Secretary. Uh, his tour as Prime Minister was handicapped by the fact that he underwent some terrible operation in the United States, and, and uh, the, the surgeons there made an awful mess of him, and he died in consequence a few days, a few weeks later. Um, I'm skipping all around here. At Arlington House that night, we had the conversation ranged over just about everything. Uh, Beaverbrook uh, asked my wife what we'd been doing in London just before that. And we'd been a couple of days before, a couple of evenings before that, we'd been to the theater and saw a show called, um, a play called My Son, My Son. And uh, Robert Morley, the famous English playwright, was played the lead character of a British press baron, and I suggested to um, Lord Beaverbrook that uh, that possibly it was a, a biographical sketch of himself, and he became quite infuriated at that suggestion, or feigned <laughs> uh, dis uh, dismay over the suggestion. He said, I never had a mistress in my life. Well, uh, if some of the articles that have been written about him are to be, be believed, uh, he, wasn't, he was departing a little from fact when he said that. Uh, however, I don't think the play was based on him particularly. Uh, just before that, uh, I, that day earlier, I'd been going down to Purley, where we lived just south of London, and uh, there were, I got on a, in the compartment of an English train. There were uh, about six people in the compartment, and uh, or including two uh, half-tight British fellows, middle-aged, who got on, and they, they were just back from the, the Middle East, from Singapore or somewhere in the Far East, on leave in England. And uh, they were running down England, and when they got off at Purley, I, as they had indicated, they would be. I was going on a few miles beyond that. Uh, 
I decided that I would hurry up their exit from the carriage, and when they opened the door, the little fellow got off first, and the other fellow got off second, and uh, I gave him a kick in the ass and sent them both flying. The big fellow landed on top of the little fellow. I had miscued the situation because I thought, like most English trains, the guard would blow the whistle and the train would take off immediately, but it didn't. They knocked, they broke the train into two parts then, and I had to wait for 10 minutes while a huge crowd, an amazing crowd gathered and said, come out and fight, you American. <laughs> All I was saying was, go away, go away, but they had decided I was an American and they didn't like that. But the train did eventually pull out and amazingly, I said nothing to the other people in the carriage and we went on. And no one else, not, no one even spoke to me about it or asked, why did you do that? Not a single word, they just went on reading their newspapers. <clears throat> uh, we went down to, uh, Arlington House was an interesting place. It was his town home. Uh, Noel Coward, I remember, went, lived there as well and he was on the elevator when we arrived there and we went up on the same elevator. He got off at a different floor. Uh, another time we went down to Checkers. We had an overnight visit to Checkers, or not Checkers, uh, that's uh, Churchill's home, uh, Cherkley, uh, near Leatherhead, near Mickleham. And uh, that was Beaverbrook's residence, of course, which has been very much in the news recently. And uh, we spent the night at Cherkley, at Cherkley and uh, uh, we, it was an amazing house, amazing property, and Beaverbrook was a great host there. He took great delight in showing us the guest book with Rudyard Kipling's uh, autograph or signature in as a, one of the guests. And, and uh, I don't know how many times uh, Kipling must have signed the book because everybody had to sign on the same page as Kipling, and I think that had been going on for 50 years or so. Um, we, an amazing feature of the house was if you looked out the living room, uh, you looked up through an alleyway of trees in the yard, and at the very end was a memorial cross, and it was floodlit, and Beaverbrook could control the lighting on this cross, which was about 150 feet away or 200 feet away, by, the, uh, by a switch in the living room. And this was, had been placed there by him at some point in memory of his wife, Gladys. And, uh, and uh, he, he took great pride in showing what he had done to honor his wife and so on. I'm not sure that his relations with his wife were all that good throughout the whole of his life. The, uh, certainly he shared his love experiences with many other women if the biographers are to be believed. Another time I went to uh, Mickleham, Surrey, just near Cherkley, and uh, Lord Bennett lived within a few miles of him, and I went over to Bennett's house. Bennett died in 1947, I think it was, and I went over a couple of months later. They had a, an auction there, and I wanted to buy some books or some, <coughs> some memento of Bennett's life. Bennett had come from Hopewell, Hill here in New Brunswick where my people had come from, my father had come from originally. And I went to the cemetery to visit uh, Bennett's grave, which was just nearby in the little church at Mickleham. And uh, Lady Beaverbrook is buried right beside uh, Lord Bennett. They're buried just within a few feet of each other. When they talk about bringing Lord Bennett's body back to Canada for reburial in Albert County, they would have to think about uh, bringing Lady Beaverbrook along as well, I guess. So we're going to have to wrap this up pretty soon. Uh. <laughs> but um, I'm wondering if you can give us kind of one maybe funny anecdote uh, that you remember about Beaverbrook. In 1960, Louis Robichaud had just been elected. And Louis um, was uh, designated by the University of New Brunswick to deliver the address at the fall convocation. This was only a couple of months. The election was in June of 1960, and I'd played quite a part in the election. and was a friend of Louis, and it helped him quite a bit in the election. Uh, he wanted me to run in that election, but I refused to do it. I think he told me that he would make me deputy premier, and uh, I would take over in 10 years' time from him, 
but I wasn't ready to take a chance on that. And I'd been interested in federal politics at that time. This was, of course, long before I was on the court. And uh, but the day approached when Louis was to deliver his address, and Beaverbrook was coming and was present for the convocation. And uh, I, it occurred to me that uh, I asked Louis one day. I said, "What are you going to talk about?" Well, he didn't really have any idea what he was going to talk about at that point. And I got a brilliant idea. I used to subscribe to Beaverbrook's newspaper, the Sunday Express, and I was aware that he was very much in favor of China joining the, being admitted to the United Nations. And I said to Louis, why don't you talk about and advocate the admission of China to the United Nations? And uh, I got Bob Love, who was my next door neighbor. Bob, we met with Louis in his office one Sunday morning. Uh, I had prepared a little screed on the admission of China to the United Nations. Bob prepared a piece on university financing, university organization in the Maritimes. And it was all put together. It was improved a little and dressed up. And Louis uh, delivered that talk at the convocation. And Beaverbrook was greatly taken by the fact that Louis was thinking was along his own lines on this uh, matter of China. I don't think he ever realized that, uh, well, it probably didn't make any difference where the idea came from anyway. That was not too significant. Anything else you can? Uh, I think that was pretty good. Anything else you want to know? I, I don't. Well, I mean, I know we could talk all day, yeah. but I know you're on a schedule as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. One question? Well, I just, it's really, uh, it's interesting with the overseas scholars how you have that London experience, and then a lot have returned to Fredericton, and, and you have that chance to, to continue in, in many cases a bit of a relationship. You want to with Lord Beaverbrook. Yeah. And did, did, would he always remember each of you? Yeah, well, uh, oh yes, he oh, would sorry, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> Just talk to the camera. Uh, yeah, yeah, Beaverbrook uh, always uh, took an interest in us afterward. Um, as a matter of fact, in 1960, uh, I'm coming backward first, 1963, uh, I, had, I was running in the Federal election here as a candidate for, as a candidate for um, York Sunbury, and uh, I had a very nice letter from Beaverbrook, he in which he said that he understood I would be winning the election and I would be going into the Pearson government as Minister of Defense. I don't know who had given him this information. I don't think he got it from Mike Pearson because he didn't. He and Mike Pearson didn't really. Uh, uh, strike it off too well, but that's a different story. It emanates from something that happened just after the war or during the war uh, when Beaverbrook sought certain favors from Pearson when he was at the High Commissioner's office in London. But uh, uh, Beaverbrook, of course, was wrong as, in his assessment of the outcome of that election. I'd been, that was the third time I was defeated, incidentally, and I never did follow that. Fortunately, they took me out of the political field and put me into the court system where I did much better and stayed much more permanently. <laughs> uh, the, uh, three or four years after we got back from overseas, we decided, or perhaps it was less time than that, we decided we should do something for Beaverbrook and the local scholars here, I got three or four or five together who'd been in our group, and uh, we bought a Jack Humphreys, uh, Jack Humphreys um, painting uh, St. John painting. He was from St. John, of course, and we presented this to Beaverbrook when he was out here. He was visiting with Michael Foote, the socialist MP, who one of the two brothers, Foote brothers, Feet brothers, I suppose you'd call them. And uh, 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 Foote was doing a biography of Beaverbrook at the time. And uh, I always remember at that time, you asked if, or someone asked if, Beaverbrook uh, remembered the scholars, and he said on that occasion, how is my old friend Hanson doing? Carlisle Hanson had been one of the members of our group, and he was in Ottawa or something at that time. My reply to Beaverbrook was that he's going right to hell, I said. And he said, what do you mean? I said, he started out a liberal, then he became a socialist, and now he's gone right downhill, he's become a Tory. 
And he turned a foot and said, did you hear that foot? Did you hear that? He was greatly taken with that suggestion that that amounted to going downhill. <laughs>